So uh, the size of the fraud in this next session is uh, scarcely believable. Uh, 55 billion euros or there or thereabouts. So the title of the session is Europe's incredible 55 billion euro Comex tax fraud scheme. And we have, a, again, a couple of journalists presenting the session, uh, Oliver and Christian. So hello, um, welcome to our session. Uh, the title is how we discovered the biggest tax robbery in European history. So that's a long title, okay. My name is Oliver Schröm. I worked for the uh, for Corrective. That's the, that's a German non-profit newsroom. Uh, but now I'm working for Panorama. It's the the oldest investigative news show in the German public TV. And that's... Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Christian Zalewski. I'm a freelance investigative journalist, also from Germany, and um, I'm also working mostly for uh, ARD's BB uh, Panorama program, which is uh, remodeled after the BBC Panorama program, actually. So it's thanks to you guys um, that, we, that we are there. And um, yeah, and some years ago, Oliver um, came into my office, but we will explain that later, and that is when we started working on that fraud. We will introduce you to this project with a short trailer. Yeah, make a long story short, but now back to the long version. Uh, <laughs> uh, we will tell you about our uh, insider, uh, Mayo Blay and the Comex deals. He gave us an exclusive interview. Uh, we like to tell you why we slipped into uh, the role of billionaires for our undercover operation here in London. So we will talk about our, in, our impact because the EU Parliament invited us and, uh, and I will tell you why a Swiss private bank hired some detective to investigate it, me. Perhaps the guys are here in the room. Hey guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it started 2013 with a phone call from Switzerland, a person informed me about Cumex. I never heard this title and I uh, understood nothing. Uh, but after uh, a long introduction into, uh, into special deals, he mentioned uh, a man, a guy, in the middle of this uh, cover, that's Carsten Maschmeyer, that's the German Donald Trump, also a self-made billionaire, and he also has a a TV show, and I hopefully he's not our next chancellor. <laughs> and uh, he is an investor of Comex, and I recognize, okay, that's a story. And we published this story in 2014 in Stern Magazine, it's a German weekly. And uh, after them, it, it, uh, nothing happened. Uh, the only thing that the private bank in Switzerland, Saracen, hired uh, two to a private investigator, uh, you see Kroll and Mark Rau or something like that. So they paid 100 uh, British, 100,000 British pounds to find out that I'm, that I'm living in Hamburg and that I'm married. So I'm pretty expensive. <laughs> and um, yeah, and now it's up to Christian because now we, in 2016, I moved to Panorama. 
Yeah, and that is when he uh, entered our office, our uh, new common office, and he brought with him a data stick. That, of course, is of high interest to an investigative journalist. So we, yeah, plugged it in. <laughs> and see there, there was a lot of data on it. Uh, 180,000 pages of investigative stuff. Um, it's court filings and proceedings and, and stuff like that. And it's all centered around the biggest uh, tax fraud investigation in Germany was ever undertaken, the Cum-Ex uh, case, basically. And so we um, combined that with a lot of other data uh, we, we were able to obtain. And from that uh, started the, the first story um, in 2017 was published uh, in Germany, nation, nation, nationwide, in television, print, and online, of course. And it has the title, The Biggest Tax Robbery in German History. And um, yeah, that is how all of that started, with me at least. So, and what we usually don't explain, but in this, for this audience of well-known experts, uh, we thought we put in a little, what is COMEX actually? Because it's, it's really highly complex, and it took, it took us a long time to really get behind that. So, um, what you see here is an invention we made, we, make, we came up with this to, to get the, uh, to, to, to um, better understand uh, how this this thing works. So what you have is um, the so-called dividend arbitrage pyramid, and um, so let me let me just uh, take you to, to a small uh, explanation here. Um, so dividend arbitrage, I'm, I'm, I'm aware, I, I think some of you are aware, has has been around for for decades. Uh, what this is is basically pure tax trading of um, blue equities, blue blue chip equities around the divex date, uh, aiming at um, at lowering your withholding tax on dividends. So what you do basically um, for the cum cum case, which is kind of a market-wide phenomenon, um, if you are have a tax liability, um, uh, if you let's say if you're an institutional investor in the U.S. and you have a lot of German blue chips, you're sitting on them. Then comes the divex date. You have to you are suffering withholding tax. As a German institutional investor, like a bank, you're not suffering withholding tax. So what you do, you just, in a circular trade, you push in all your stocks into Germany just some days before the DIVX date, then um, collecting the tax, the bank, your partner is collecting the tax, the stock goes back and you share the profit, basically. The, the profit is the tax. But this happens once. This tax has been paid. It has been paid and now it's been given out again. This is not in the sense of the inventor, of course, but um, it's, it's, um, it's kind of an abuse of tax law, but not necessarily criminal. So if you imagine the next step, that would be the Cumex case. This is um, <coughs> that you, 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 you do the same stunt, basically, um, but you make it more complicated. You put in a short sale just before the DIVX date. And that leads to um, two parties in that carousel scheme getting a tax voucher, meaning taxes paid once and paid out twice, I think. You don't? No, it's okay. Okay. So this is, this is the basic purpose of COMEX. So it's not tax avoidance, it's tax theft. So you, you, you're, you're grabbing into the tax coffers. You're not avoiding taxes. Um, so that is, you create a situation which a share appears to have multiple owners at the given point of time. Uh, the capital gains tax, which is actually paid only once, is certified multiple times and can be also claimed for multiple tax purposes. The trading pattern itself looks like this. Okay, this is complicated, but not, actually not so much. You have the stock company on the right, uh, on the left from your view. Uh, this is paying the uh, withholding tax on the dividend. The dividend goes to central banking um, and from there to the custodian bank. But then, um, this, this, is the, this is the normal case on the, the left here. But then you have a short seller who is short selling the stock to a, to a, a bank in Germany and um, by that creating another tax voucher, so to say. And it has to deliver the stock only two days later. So that is why you can, if you do it over the, 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 the uh, record date, you can create like two tax vouchers and by that um, going to the tax authority and reclaim tax twice. That is the so-called double dip. Um, and this is surely criminal. Um, in Germany, we have now criminal proceedings going on against this, and this is at the core. This is the basic model. It has been 
a uh, lot of under other models. I just want to go back here for one second because uh, you, there have been more aggressive models introduced also to the market. So what, you, what we also see is um, you do it with the same stock like 10 times. So taking out 10 times of withholding tax, which is paid once, or the most aggressive version we have seen is um, if you own the custodian bank, you can basically print out your tax vouchers yourself. So making it's in, in, in indefinite. You can basically, as long as your paper lasts, <laughs> and as long as you're willing to be so aggressive, you can just go to the tax authority and say, come on, give me money. That has happened in Denmark, for example. Um, so this is a highly, highly innovative industry, and uh, the Cumex case um, is the most aggressive tax fraud we have seen in Germany ever. So. So, shortly before we published the story, uh, I, I, I got another stick, and we have not in, we had not enough time to to took a look in this new material. And after we published the story, we recognized, oh, there's a lot of material about this guy. His name is Hanno Berger. He's a highly specialized tax lawyer in Germany. Now he's living in Switzerland because the prosecutor in Germany sued him because we called him, because his involvement in Cumex deals, we called him Mr. Cumex. And uh, we also find an email from Hanno Berger to Paul Mora. Perhaps somebody of you know this guy. He lived here in London. He's a trader. And... Hanno asked Paul, hey, let's go up with Cumex in other countries. And we were pretty surprised because we thought only in Germany it's working. And then we asked, uh, as, uh, it's just, it was just a plan or they realized this plan and they tried to rob Europe. Yeah, that, that was the starting point basically of our uh, next project after we had published the German story, so to speak, in 2017. Yeah, we stumbled over that email and, and saw um, that the, this group of people, uh, they were reaching out to other experts and our tax experts in other countries and asking basically, is there, uh, can we do this similar stunt uh, somewhere else? And um, that is when we um, uh, got in contact with colleagues from Denmark. Um, maybe can I just, yeah. yeah. So, and that is the, um, when, when we, um, because they had kind of a similar problem, they got, they got hit pretty heavily as, um, He's now explaining, and from that, uh, it's the same group of people which moved north after in Germany, the, it, it was more or less uh, closed down by prosecutors, and um, that is from, from that this collaboration uh, started. So, perhaps our colleagues can introduce themselves. I joined it because uh, we discovered quite early that this was not like just like a, a Danish story, it was surely an international story, it was a European story. It was a big story in the Netherlands in uh, 2006 already, so I was obviously very interested and also intrigued by uh, the whole setup and basically also yeah, uh, amazed that, uh, that uh, so many years after uh, that uh, the, the thing was still going on. Um, so obviously I wanted to cooperate and be part of that investigation. So our challenge as a technical team was to um, find a way where everyone can access very secure the documents, but in the same time we need to keep a workflow that uh, is easy uh, for a journalist. It was extremely important to be able to trust some long distance communications and uh, of course we have a technical team that is constantly updating the kind of encrypted apps encrypted uh, emails that we use and we all had the chance to look at the same database through a secure VPN which made it much much more safe to be working on that issue. It's very well done by Coercitive uh, by setting up a great uh, uh, safe uh, database where safe communications encrypted and uh, uh, all the necessary means to be able to communicate in a proper manner. So a network of European uh, journalists working on a cross-border 
investigation like this increases the level of trust um, of citizens in media. I'm a freelancer and I'm working alone on this. Um, so um, these meetings um, help me not lose focus uh, because, as you said, um, I'm obviously looking at the Spanish angle of the story, but uh, hearing what other people has to say about their own countries um, keeps me um, keep the focus on the European dimension, which I think it's important, and it also brings you uh, brings my own Spanish story under a new light. So it also helps me, um, you know, find possible leads or, or possible different angles that I hadn't thought about. It was a, an exciting opportunity for us at Reuters to cooperate with many colleagues from all around Europe to tell the story about an organized group who had made tax reclaims to which they were not entitled, at least in the eyes of the German and other European prosecutors. Only through this cooperation was it possible to give a true impression of the European scale of the story. We should avoid like telling this or that this or that national story. I mean, the good thing would be if we could really like tell the European story in in, in numerous European countries. I think that would be like um, that's very important for us. Yeah, and that's what we uh, did in the end. So we met um, every six weeks, I think maybe for half a year. A little longer, um, and uh, yeah, discussed uh, not only our national angles to that phenomenon, but um, kind of matched like what, how can we tell the European story of that? Because it is a European phenomenon. This div up industry does not stop at borders. The Comex case in Germany was, of course, the largest and the biggest um, because Germany has a big uh, stock exchange uh, for blue chips, but um, it was all over Europe. And it was um, concentrated, what was made, made out of the city of London, the big investment banks were orchestrating this. They, they have tax trading desks um, uh, where, they, where they look for new ways to target uh, these, uh, these uh, withholding tax um, profits. So that is how we work together and we um, at Corrective and we, we um, of course had um, uh, secure communication set up and a secure database with all the files. Uh, searchable. Uh, I think that is something, um, for example, the Panama Papers also used, um, but Corrective built our own version for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah okay, and that is, that is uh, basically the, what, we, what we found out in the end, um, what we could really prove in the end, um, uh, that uh, through these div up schemes, mostly of them, COMEX, um, 55.2 billion euros were stolen from European taxpayers. 30 plus banks are investigated. The number here, 100 plus individuals, is, uh, is outdated. I think it's about 400 now um, are being prosecuted in Germany alone. Um, and um, yeah, and after 2011, um, they, they reorganized their scheme. But these are, these are the countries we could prove to be hit by these kind of schemes. So the, the leaked documents were our uh, nuggets and we, we shared every, pages, every page with our colleagues, but uh, really important for us was that we found uh, an insider, uh, a former major player in the Cumex deals, the, the right hand of Hanno Berger, he's the main uh, witness of the, the attorney in, in Germany, and he also gave us an exclusive interview about two days and uh, yeah, give us a lot of information. Sorry. Hello. Yeah, is a forgotten So. Um, He's a little bit nervous, and this is, this, this is not his real face, that's a mask, so that was the deal, the interview, but not, we, we guarantee him the, his, uh, his personal things, and it works. Uh, in the interview, he gave us a lot of information, and I think it's also an uh, insight of, of the 
psychological mindset of the traders. So we will show you a, a longer sequence of the interviews. Yeah. And maybe let me just add that. Um, so this interview was, when was it again? Um, April last year. April last year, right. And just some weeks ago, this man testified in court um, as the crown witness of the prosecution in the first and biggest or most important pilot case, uh, COMEX um, proceedings in a German court. So, um, and he basically repeated a lot of what he told us uh, a year earlier. Selbstwertgefühl bzw. wir haben uns einfach als die Genies gesehen. Man konnte ganz einfach sagen, in diesem Elfenbeinturm, in dem wir gearbeitet haben, stellen Sie sich einfach ein 38 Stockwerk hohes Haus in Frankfurt in der Finanzmetropole Frankfurt vor und stellen Sie sich vor, da arbeiten. 40 Personen, die alle meinen, das Rad neu erfunden zu haben, in ihrem Bereich, Steuerrecht, Banken, Kapitalanlagen. Und genau so haben wir uns gefühlt, da oben. Wenn Sie dann runtergeguckt haben auf die Straße, auf die Taubesanlage, da haben Sie nur noch ganz kleine Menschen gesehen. Und das war die Welt. Aber... Uh -huh. 
selbst wenn sie nachher so viel Geld auf dem Konto haben, dass sie das in ihrem ganzen Leben nicht mehr ausgeben können. Das war auch noch zu einem Zeitpunkt, als Komplex nicht inkriminiert war. Das heißt, es hat einen, es hat einen Zeitpunkt gegeben, wenn wir damals ausgestiegen waren. Ich habe kein Abonnement gedrückt. Wäre das zu all dem gar nicht gekommen, worüber wir heute sprechen. Aber es ging nicht mehr um Zahlen. Es ging nicht mehr um die nächste Million. Es ging um den Thrill. Die Herausforderung, das ist der zweite Punkt, die Herausforderung, immer schlauer zu sein als alle anderen. Ich kann das vielleicht auch wirklich in diesem ganz platten Satz pressen. Wir haben da oben in diesem 32. Stock aus dem Fenster geguckt und haben gedacht, wir sind die Schlausten. So, let me start with the so far last chapter of our investigation. Uh, we knew that Germany was robbed, we knew that Europe was robbed, and we asked us, so it's really over or it's still going on? Because uh, sources in Dubai told us uh, there are some traders here in, in London, they tried again, and he, he leaked us a, a, a market offer. So, but we have no idea if this market offer was real or ju just a fake. And so we came to this decision to start a, a little bit of crazy undercover operation. Right? Warte mal, warte mal. Warte mal, Oli. Um, uh, so maybe uh, as a little background to that is that in 2011, uh, 2012, um, the tax law was changed in Germany. So from that, allegedly, um, Cum-Ex, the classical Cum-Ex scheme was stopped. So that is what we've been told all the time. And uh, yeah, in fact, it was lowered a lot, but then the, let's call it the div-up industry, found obviously new ways around it. So, and um, as I explained with the, with the pyramid, the, the, it's, it's still evolving. It's a virus which is always evolving. And um, so we had uh, hints that we, um, um, that, that it's still going on. And that is why we went undercover. So, um, so what we did is basically we um, uh, we, we uh, tried to uh, get into the room with a guy who had this actual market offer for us for div up trades in half of Europe. For that we um, because these guys are not talking to everybody, um, we posed as billionaires um, and rented a, a nice suite in the Shard here in London. And um, yeah, it was a lot of, the, the whole setup took us maybe half a year, or more than four months at least, uh, to, to get into that room, um, because we had to build trust um, via emails. We had to, um, we, we were using existing offshore um, companies to, to have a credible background. And um, so it was a lot of, lot of work to get into that room. And all of course, to prove on camera which is legal in London, uh, not, uh, not so much in Germany, <laughs> um, at least with the sound recording, um, uh, uh, that, that there is people still running around, um, investment bankers, and are offering um, high-value investors tax deals um, throughout Europe. And um, yeah, then we, was, we were a, lot, a little excited who, was, who would be walking through that door, and um, after a while, this guy showed up. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, our assistant is the, the wife of our colleague. So she, she was shopping before this upper, undercover operation. <laughs> so then we sat down and he basically uh, handed us over his proposal for doing tax trades in seven European countries. And our investment opportunity would be 150 million euros which would be leveraged up to more than 1 billion euros, and then we would go for tax trading. Um, and this is all calculated. Um, every single uh, trade is foreseeable because you have no market risk at all, and this is all hedged. It's all about tax and nothing else. And this is what he also confirms. I think. Yeah, and I asked him, come on, guy, put it on the table, the, the money come from the tax, and he answered, yes, of, of course. Sorry, 
it's too late. So, yes, another title for the same business. And for us, it was pretty exciting that we have the proof in our hand that it's still going on with COMEX and similar trades in, whole, in the whole Europe, perhaps also in Germany. So, uh, yeah. so then we published, together with our partners, uh, all our findings. So the, the, the estimate of 55 billion, our undercover stunt, and, and lots of other stuff, big stories uh, all over Europe. Uh, France and Spain, I think they didn't, the broader public didn't even know about these div up schemes um, when they published. So it was, it was big news. Um, and uh, then shortly afterwards, we were invited to the European Parliament to the Tax 3 Committee, which is a subcommittee working on um, tax related matters. I think it's uh, sort of the um, continuation of the Panama Papers Committee. Um, and there we basically uh, explained our findings and uh, the European Parliament then voted to trigger the first ever EU investigation uh, into the integrity of the financial markets in Europe by the overseeing boards ESMA and EBA, European Banking Authority. So this report, the, 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 these, um, uh, just, just recently uh, the um, first report of that investigation has been published and uh, it shows clear evidence that uh, our findings were correct, that uh, the tax trading is still ongoing and um, yeah, so we feel uh, confirmed here. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. The guy who walked in to the hotel room, what's happened to him, if anything? Uh, he never called us, so <laughs> I think he's a little bit nervous because um, the investigator, perhaps they know his name, but we, doesn't, uh, we did not mention his name, we did not show his face and something like that, but I'm pretty sure he's just in business now here in London. Is he under criminal investigation? Perhaps, <laughs> but we don't know... Uh, which police is uh, looking for him, or perhaps it's the German police. I'm pretty sure it's not the British police because the, the British guys are not so interested in COMEX and similar trades investigations. But I can let me add that um, this guy uh, learned that the craft um, uh, at uh, a very famous COMEX trader named Sanjay Shah. So he's from his kind of stable. And uh, therefore, I think he might be under uh, for, of interest also to authorities, yes. How much money has been recovered? So it's a you know, 55 billion euro fraud approximately, give or take. It's only in, in 10 countries in Europe, so that's the result of our investigation, but I'm pretty sure it's much more money. Uh, but how much money has actually been recovered for, you know, on behalf of the tax authorities? I don't know the actual number right now, but I think in Germany it's uh, some billion euros, which have may maybe even not even have been paid out, so it didn't come to the fraud, it was a try, um, and others are being trying to be recollected. It's also in the case, in the court case we just mentioned, where our Crown Witness is now testifying, that uh, financial institutions are kind of ac accused also, and if they are uh, found liable, uh, then they have to repay um, 160 million euros in this one single case only. So they, there is, of course, now criminal proceedings, and there's a lot of work done to get money back. I think the Danish colleagues, are, uh, the Danish colleagues, the Danish state um, is also aggressively trying to get money back. Um, but yeah, I think that, that that's up to you then, guys in here. <laughs> Uh, thank you. It's just a clarification and follow-up uh, question to David's um, question. Um, do I understand correctly in your answer that you were implying that the person who walked into the room and whose face is obscured was actually, you, you believe he is a front man 
rather than a principal. He's a front man for others. Is, is that a fair description or have I got that wrong? I, I wouldn't uh, decide if he's a front man. I mean, he's, uh, he's a salesperson, I think. Um, and of course, for a cum -ex scheme, you need a lot of players to be uh, part of that, you know? You need custodian banks, you need leverage providers, you need, I don't know what, uh, you name it. So it's, it's, of course, someone is maybe approaching investors or fake investors and asking for a lot of fuel for the machine, but uh, the machine itself consists of a lot of different players and they all have to agree to that. So, yeah, of course, he's the guy walking into the room and pitching, this, pitching the deal, but um, behind that, there is a network. Were big institutions involved in this? That's Deutsche Bank, just to throw a name out there. Or was it sort of smaller, you know, unknown? Uh, uh, the main witness was asked, which bank is not in, uh, is involved in this, this trades? And his answer wa was, please ask me which bank is not involved. So our in interrogation is <laughs> faster at the end. Um, yeah, and let me add, we, we also published a story, which was only in German, uh, though, about the origin of the modern kind of cum -ex virus in the city of London. And it, uh, it started with the big American investment banks, and from there it spread, the knowledge spread, because these guys were doing so much money and uh, getting the big bonuses. So, of course, it was kind of a trade secret, but everybody wanted to know how that worked. And then uh, these guys changed, um, uh, changed, changed employers and took the trade secret with them. So it's, it spread out from there throughout the city of London, the big investment banks, the, you, there's no one, none uh, which, which was not in, a, in some capacity involved in that. Did this originate in the city of London? Yes. This modern COMEX scheme, no, not the, the regular diff up thing, of course, it's very old. And what action, if any, have the ci uh, city of London police or whoever would be the appropriate regulatory body or law enforcement body, what action have they, have they taken? None, none to our knowledge. <laughs> and that is typical of London, you know, I'm an investigative journalist. Dealing with British law enforcement or regulators, you almost feel like smashing your head against a brick wall. They are so incompetent or uninterested. So here we have a you know, huge, huge fraud and nothing is being done. Yeah, I mean, that we also wondered why nothing is happening. Um, because um, also, I mean, the, 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 let's, let's look at the American um, banks, maybe. The, there, was a, the, there was a report on that kind of fraud schemes, not the, the specific Cumex case, but the diff up as a big business. Uh, even 2008 in the US, there was a, a, a subcommittee in Congress investigating that. And afterwards, they just didn't um, bother. So. Yeah, hello. My name is Gero von Pelchertzim. I'm a German lawyer based in Frankfurt, practicing in criminal defense and white collar crime. And uh, thank you, Herr Schrimm and Herr Zalewski. This was a very brilliant uh, uh, speech. Um, and uh, I'm very impressed how you were able to uh, present us a very complex matter in an easy way. So uh, I know that is very complex since uh, we defend a bunch of people or advise uh, individuals in, in this matter. And uh, it, it, it uh, takes a few days to understand what's actually behind it. There's one thing, um, what, let's put it that way. I'm very impressed, I'm very happy and thankful for your speech. But um, there's one thing I'm not very happy with. And this was your statement that you said, it is surely criminal. Um, it might be, in your opinion, surely criminal, but we have no verdict, we have no upper jurisdiction yet um, that this is actually criminal misconduct or of, uh, any criminal uh, fraud. So um, I think we can say it might be immoral, <laughs> but if it is criminal, it is up to the courts to decide and uh, yeah, this is only what I wanted to add. Thank you. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah you're right. It goes to my uh, point. It goes to me because I said that. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, formally, it is, there's no verdict yet, but uh, I think um, it might, might be uh, assumable that this might be the outcome in the end. So given also that uh, German, uh, the German uh, federal um, uh, government sees that as highly criminal, that we have, of course, verdict in financial courts 
who you're fully aware of that, just recently uh, uh, um, ruled that this is of uh, high criminal conduct and stuff like that. But yeah, there is no um, Strafrechtsurteil yet. Um, hi, uh, my name is Malin Obst. I'm another German in the room. Um, I've got a question about reactions you encountered during your investigation, because I think you were under investigation during the Maschmeyer investigation, that economic espionage in Switzerland, right? Uh, did something similar happen to some of the other partners in the investigation in other European countries? Did you get that kind of reaction to your investigation? <coughs> Not in the COMEX files, but uh, something similar happened with, um, with a colleague in France, with the, with the LuxLeaks. He was also sued because he got some secret material but um, in the COMEX files, I'm the only one, so I'm not happy about this case, but it stopped now. Two, uh, two weeks ago, the, uh, the, the attorney in, in Zürich informed me that he stopped now after five years to, to looking for me, so I'm happy. So you can go back to Switzerland then? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Mark Tenner from BBC Panorama. Um, I'm here, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, in 2009, Barclays Bank got an injunction against The Guardian that tried to publish six div up schemes that they were running in their tax avoidance department at Structured Capital Markets, which was, that's all it did. Um, in 2013, Barclays said it shut down Structured Capital Markets and it was no longer doing develop schemes. Why is the UK left out of your investigation? Was there no evidence that, that, that it was going on here? Uh, there are a lot of evidence, sorry, there are lots of, lot of evidence, but we can't talk about this because perhaps it's our next story. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to ask you regarding the, uh, how this was sold. I mean, you obviously met with this uh, salesman, but was this sort of just offered like any financial product uh, by the banks and then to what sort of investors? And also regarding the question about this being criminal, I heard not that long ago that uh, in Denmark, because I know there are some of colleagues of mine who have been working on this case there, and they were worried that at least in Denmark they, this wouldn't get through court because there were some um, unclarity about the legal standing. I mean, was this legal at the time uh, or illegal at the time that this was being sold? So, yeah, these two things, but the, the criminality and the how these products were sold. I mean, obviously, 55 billions, I mean, that takes some while to sort of distribute that out. Okay, for the first thing is, um, um, yeah, as we said, we, we went as, uh, we posed as undercover billionaires because this is a market which is usually interbanking um, and not so much open for investors. We are not bankers and we couldn't find a legend as an investment banker. So, so what we did, we um, we tried to try this route and um, uh, sure, they, they are looking for, for uh, secretive money to fund the machine of tax trading. And, um, uh, but you need, uh, you need investors for that. So, um, and that is, that is how we managed to get in there. But it was an ultra high net worth individual setting, of course. It was not like, you know, like going to the next bank and asking for your accountant at the desk. So um, it took a long time to get into that room, to build the trust up, to, to you know, be trusted as being billionaires. Um, second question, criminality. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not so much for us to decide as journalists which, what, is, what is exactly criminal, what can be twisted to seem legal, uh, what can we do to... Um, so, but we, we aim for the, for the as the um, uh, colleague said, for the, um, maybe for the moral argument more. Um, um, the legal argument is, a, is, a, is, of course, a very important one, but this is, let's speak not in legal terms, but this is pure tax theft. 
I mean, that is obvious. So you cannot reclaim something which has never been paid. It doesn't make sense. The, the sense of the world is twisted already there. And then, of course, there's an army of lawyers who, uh, who can make everything seem in a way legal. And now what we have, we have now, to, we have now uh, um, the state um, uh, the, uh, is, is now trying to fight back against that twisted legality. So in court and through other means, and uh, if in the end every single scheme is being deemed illegal and even criminally prosecuted, we will see. But um, let's call it for a reputational point of view, um, I think the judgment is clear. So there will be like thousands of potential clients who have made money on this over 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, yeah, mostly the banks made money on their books, but of course there were also investors, and many of them, who made, made a lot of money with, uh, with that. Now, f talking about criminality, you cannot argue that every investor knew everything about that scheme, so maybe, you know, it was in good faith, so to speak. But um, at a tech, tech trading desk, at a major investment bank, I wouldn't argue for good faith. Uh, second question. Um, I think I read in your reporting that one argument of the German government to not impose that tax law they imposed in 2012 during the financial crisis was that this type of income was one of the only types of incomes left for banks. So that was kind of an argument why, the, why it took them so long to actually fight this. Are you satisfied with the response, especially by the German government now, on the legal part of it? Or are you still thinking that some parts of our government are actually not that willing to fight this? I think now they are willing to fight that. We had a special investigative committee in the Bundestag also about that, and I think the public pressure is high enough now that, uh, so that, that now they are moving. Um, speaking again about the question of legality and how, how can that be legal or not legal? I mean, this is a, a decade of hardcore lobbying effort uh, into, went into these uh, financial rulings, which are then uh, twisted, uh, interpretations twisted. Um, uh, uh, so th that is one point. So um, you have to see that um, uh, when they, when they w there was a major tax law change in 2007, which was a direct, was, was a written proposal from the banking lobby and that was taken one on one, copy and paste, and went, uh, went, w became law. And that is like when the party started, really. Um, and then in the end, when they stopped it in 2012, no lobbyist was involved. So that is why it worked in the end. And now it's the basic COMEX, the old school COMEX principle is in Germany for the moment dead. In Cologne, there are more than 400 people are under investigation because COMEX and two were sued now and uh, the trial started at the end of September. So perhaps that's the answer if it's criminal or not. I think it's criminal. And it's proceeding still ongoing. So that's right. <laughs> yeah, we've been there the, the, the last couple of weeks. And uh, if, you, if you watch that judge uh, asking questions, you have a feeling what the outcome might be. I might be biased, but I, I, I might be proven wrong, but still, that's okay. Fair point. Up until the first uh, ruling, we will be very careful with our wording. Uh, can I ask you about your, your insider and um, uh, how uh, you, sort of you came through the process of him getting to where you, we saw him and, and, and giving evidence anonymously and, and just explain in terms of his anonymity and where that's at with the case at the moment because I'm not clear about how that works. If he is still anonymous in public. So, uh, yes, here's a short answer. <laughs> um. Yeah, he is. Um, he is. Uh, he, he mentioned in our interview already uh, that that he made 50 million euros personally from that, and he calls himself a small fish. Um, but okay, still, 
and uh, of course he says he as he is kind of aiming for a crown witness uh, you know being getting off the hook rule um, he, of course he has to pay that back for that and and and, and he's still he just said in, in court uh, that he is in um, uh, call it um, negotiations with the tax authority how exactly you do that because of course if you work for 10 years as a tax attorney not you cannot you know you have to look which one is no really Comex related, which one is not, I don't know. So, and, um, but that is what, lead, at least what he said in court and in our interview, that he, is, he wants to pay that back. I have no, this is really up for any future judge. He's, he's been a witness now. Uh, he will be um, uh, accused also sometime later down the road. If that, works that he's, he's, he's not going to prison. I don't know, I mean, uh, it's, in Germany we have a high court ruling that uh, if you, if you um, uh, steal more than one million euro effective in taxes, that you cannot go free by any means. So you have to, you have to do time. And um, I think if, it's, if you go aim for the crown witness rule, which is pretty new in, in German criminal law, but maybe some experts can correct me on that, um, you have to uh, have a ju have a, uh, a judgment uh, beneath uh, three lower than three years. Then you can go court free. But so if he if he hits that sweet spot, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's completely open. Has he applied for or is he eligible for a whistleblower reward? We don't have. I don't. I, to my knowledge, we don't have uh, something like that in Germany. No, and, and also he has been. He was prosecuted before he came forward. So you know that is not really whistleblowing. That is saving your ass. <laughs> he, he, he is in. Is under investigation since 2012 or something like that. And 2015, he decided to change the side and talk with the attorney. Perhaps it's a better way. The other way is directly to prison. Interested uh, by uh, the topic you raised, David, about getting the money back. I mean, we are a few lawyers here, uh, greedy lawyers, who would be mo more than willing to assist governments in getting that money back. By the way, I'm Stéphane Bonifaci from the Paris Bar. Uh, but um, I I'm not sure governments, I mean, it's good to go criminal, but getting the money back, criminal proceedings will not get you very far. Do you see is the German, are the German tax authorities, the Danish tax authorities considering seriously getting that money back in a, you know, aggressive and maybe liaising with the private practice to achieve something? Um, okay, for Germany, I, I, until now, we, I, I don't think that there is kind of a public-private partnership in rec reclaiming uh, tax loss, but uh, maybe uh, you can propose that. Uh, the, Danish, uh, the Danish state, to our knowledge, um, hired private, um, private help in getting the money back and is uh, kind of trying to get hold of the, um, uh, of the funds of Mr. Sanjay Shah, who is under criminal uh, investigation in Denmark. So I think they have kind of a privatized arm in that. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. So we'll now have lunch, which is on floor one, the Novello restaurant, which is where several of you, I'm sure, had breakfast.